Okay. Thank you. I really want to thank Dr. Chow for his uh, wonderful lecture. It is always a pleasure to follow him, even though I never followed him, so it is a pleasure. <laughs> I want to apologize. Uh, in uh, our outline, we said that he was not practicing. He tells me he does practice. He just does not take new patients. Actually, I was about to change my entire mind about everything and say that I don't have anything to say. He said everything, but that's not how the system goes. So. I also want to tell you some good news before we get all depressed about everything. Uh, the <laughs> President and uh, Congress and President have reversed that 21.3% cut for six months. So well, if you didn't get paid, you were at the present rate or 21.3% cut, you will get a reimbursement for that also from June 1st. So until November, we are okay. <laughs> So as I said, this is a very good lecture in general terms, but uh, Dr. Chow really didn't go into the exact mechanics of uh, APS guidelines and uh, what I think is missing there. So as you know, there is three sides to every story. He said, she said, and the truth. Now, in this case, he told you, I'm going to tell you, like Fox News, you make the determination about the truth. So this is my disclaimer. I do have a major conflict of interest because of preservation of the interventional pain management. So conflicts of interest come in many, many ways. Even though I have not received any funding, I have spent a lot of money on this specialty, so that could be considered as a conflict of interest. I'm not a methodologist, I'm not a scientist, I'm just a country doctor. And according to my wife, I'm not an expert on anything, so. <laughs> so Dr. Chow said, everything comes with a cost and is associated with the burden. There is no perfect treatment. We all agree with this. There is no gold standard for distinguishing between symptomatic and asymptomatic anatomic abnormalities. You look at an image and say, I'm going to block that but you may be blocking an anatomic abnormality that is not the source of the pain. Now, if you read more of his articles, these variations go on. These are totally different dimensions. You look at ASA guidelines, which just came out two, three months ago. Everything has a very high recommendation, strong recommendation. This uh, Dr. Steve Santos said the same thing, and finally John Lozier says there is absolutely no evidence that increasing use of hardware improves the outcome for the patient. Of course, there is no disagreement on that part. The only thing is increasing the hardware, using the hardware after this statement, they used it as the standard for provocation discography. So we know that hardware doesn't work, but we still used it to validate provocation discography. You just can't do that. Medicine is more of an art and not a perfect science. JFK said we must never forget that art is not a form of propaganda. It is a form of truth, just because it is not science. Even then, all methodologists and some physicians believe that they are infallible scientists and medicine is a perfect science. So how do we apply EBM, they quoted uh, Dr. Eddy. I actually happened to hear one of his lectures. We went to a conference on this evidence-based medicine. There, there were a room full of people. Do you know how many our practicing doctors were there? Four from us, only we went there. Everything else was from insurance companies and so on and so forth, ECRI, AHRQ. When there is evidence, he showed that same thing. When there is evidence that something works and benefits the patient, we should do it, of course. But methodologists and some physicians always try to make certain that nothing works. When we have evidence that there is no benefit, we should not do it, especially when it takes away the resources or causes harm. Now, there is a part of physicians, clinicians, who do not want to accept this and they just want to go and do that. There is a reasonable assumption. 
When there is insufficient evidence, we should not do it at all, especially in the present healthcare atmosphere. But both sides try to ignore that. Evidence is like religion and politics. It, different, it means different things to different people. It is in the eyes of the reviewer. So don't be afraid to see what you can see. Oh, I just want to make it more fun here. Maybe someone can help you quantify the value of your research and development work. The only people who can quantify the value of research are liars and morons. <laughs> Maybe we could hire a consultant that just turns a liar into a thief. <laughs> so you saw the, what David Sackett said. The is interesting issue here is the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of current best evidence. It is the current best evidence. It is not a randomized trial. It is not performed in an academic center. It is the current best evidence. Is it a science of methodology, EBM, or is it a science of uh, medicine? It almost looks like it is the science of methodology nowadays. So you have to take various aspects, uh, clinical state and circumstances, patients' preferences and actions, and research evidence. But in today's atmosphere, the only thing they are taking into consideration is the research evidence. They're trying to ignore all these other factors. Lack of evidence in the literature is not evidence of lack of effectiveness. That is what Paul Lee said. We must remember that absence of proof is not the same as the absence of fact. It simply demonstrates the lack of adequate research. So there is a lot of rumors about lack of effectiveness of IPM, and there are so many guidelines going forth back and forth. I've been talking to actually folks in England recently. They are in worse shape than we are, so don't worry about it. <laughs> there are lots of people who say that it won't work. The methodologists definitely do that. Scientists, physician methodologists, non-interventional physicians, non-practicing physicians, physicians with conflicts of interest, organizations with conflicts of interest, insurers, some regulators, some physicians who use them and teach them, but publish that they do not work. But also some reasonable interventionalists when there is no evidence. Uh, I've been threatened many times with lawsuits from my, our own membership when we say that something doesn't work. Actual hierarchy of evidence is this is how it was. This, this is how it is still in the major books or articles. It is N of one randomized control trial then systematic reviews of randomized trials, single randomized trials, systematic review of observational studies, so on and so forth. You heard about the parachute uh, used to prevent the death. This was one of the best randomized trials performed. Study selection, everything was good. Perfect score, I think. Conclusion was the basis for parachute use is purely observational and its apparent efficacy could potentially be explained by healthy cohort effect. As Dr. Chow said, you really don't need a study for something like that, but this still. <laughs> so let us look at APS guidelines. The, they have the main document. It says APS slash AAPM clinical guidelines for the evaluation and management of low back pain evidence review. It is published on their APS website. All the tables, everything else show APS slash dash AAPM. And it was authored by two authors, Chow and Huffman. I didn't hear Dr. Chow mentioning AAPM at all in the speech. The press release was APS and ACP guidelines for interventional techniques. And there were multiple authors for that. And there are multiple publications with multiple authors, probably 11 or 12 publications. The interest here is the non-surgical interventional therapies for low back pain. This had four authors, and two of them appear to be, sorry, two of them are the interventional pain physicians, I think. I know Rosenquist is, but I don't know the other one. The other recommendations, APS, ACP recommendations for opioids, they give a pretty positive recommendation for opioids. 
I just don't see where the evidence comes from. I'm not against opioids, but I just want to see where the evidence comes from. But at the same time, they say that there are no randomized trials for non-interventional, non-surgical interventional therapies. This is the same thing this was in the, I just picked up from their press release when they did it some time ago. So there is no gold standard for distinguishing symptomatic from asymptomatic anatomic abnormalities, and they talk about provocation discography, selective nerve root blocks, facet joint medial branch and SI joint blocks. With the steroid injections for non-radicular low back pain, there was not much data. Facet joint injections, they said there was not much data. Same therapeutic medial branch blocks, they said no trials. Epidural injections for radiculopathy or prolapsed disc, short-term benefit. Spinal cord stimulation was one good one here. We agree with them, and that was one of the ones we did agree. Fair evidence, and poor evidence was for intrathecal infusion systems, percutaneous adhesolysis, and interdiscal therapies. So we tried to look at the these guidelines and try to review ourselves. Uh, looks like I may have done some mistakes according to his practice patterns and those things in any case. If you look at that, we have a lot of people from England involved in this uh, second part. Guidelines making, you need transparency, accountability, consistency, independence. Transparency equals methodology, probably. I don't know, I could be wrong, but you can look at the types of interventions, literature search, selection criteria, outcome measures, methodologic quality assessment, and analysis of evidence. Types of interventions they looked at are facet joint nerve blocks, provocation discography, sacroiliac joint nerve blocks, and therapeutic, those are the subjects they evaluated extensively. Their databases and everything was fine, but our review showed that they missed multiple manuscripts. They missed about two or three systematic reviews, multiple provocation discography studies, multiple facet joint diagnostic studies. Either maybe they just didn't include those or may, did not miss, or I don't know. But they were not there. Two therapeutic facet joint pain studies, one endoscopic adhesiolysis study. These were published before their search criteria, but they were still missed. They used only controlled observational studies for surgical procedures, which I don't have any objection. The relief is only 20%. Actually, in a lot of our studies, we use 50% relief as from the baseline as the standard significant improvement. Their functional scores are pretty low. Recently, there have been multiple articles saying that the functional status improvement should be 50% or so. Duration of pain relief, I, I don't have any idea. I can't get an idea. I think it is six weeks short term, more than six weeks long term. We use it six months and so these are all different things. It really doesn't matter what we used. This is what AHRQ summarized. They looked at all the guidelines, and they came up with these. 